So it's time to start our first garden visit of the day. And uh, we'll be going to Al Kite's garden in Moraga. And we'll start with um, the front garden before photo. So um, in the drought of the 1970s, Al thought, it doesn't make sense to pour scarce water onto lawns. And he began removing his front and back lawn. This is Al's front garden in this uh, border of beautiful manzanita. Um, this 45 year old garden was planted in stages. Uh, this is Al's, I think his 14th year on the tour. Um, this garden is 99% native and the only plants in this low maintenance garden that are watered are new plants that are just getting established and Al doesn't even have a irrigation system. He just waters by hand when he needs to. This garden has attracted more than 90 species of birds. And I think Al has a bird list. If you go to um, the Garden Tours website under View the Gardens, look in Moraga, you'll see Al's uh, um, garden and you can see his bird list. This is also Al's front garden. He has this sinuous path with vine maples. And this is the back garden. Um, and as I'm going through the next series of photos from Al's back garden, uh, I'd like to do a special introduction to my friend, Al Kite, who is an inspirational figure who has affected many people's lives. So Al was the first baseball and basketball coach at Skyline High School in Oakland in the early 1960s. He was then hired by UC Berkeley to coach baseball, tennis, and basketball. A number of his former students have asked me over the years if the Al Kite with the beautiful garden in Moraga is the same Al Kite who was their favorite teacher. And the answer is yes. Uh, Al is also renowned in the fly fishing world. Uh, he has taught, consulted, and given talks on fly fishing and fly casting. He has led fly fishing trips and he is the author of numerous fly fishing books, including The Orvis Guide to Better Fly Casting, among others. For many years, Al has made monthly outreach visits to homeless people who are living on the streets of West Oakland, mentoring men who are recovering from drug and alcohol abuse. Fortunately for us, 45 years ago, Al also became interested in gardening with California native plants. And in his many years of showing his garden on the tour, he's taught many people about how they can have beautiful native plant gardens while still conserving water, eliminating pesticide use, and providing habitat for wildlife. So without further ado, let's go now and tour Al's beautiful garden in Moraga. Hi, Al, how are you? Hi, Kathy. Good morning to you Good. and to others. <laughs> and welcome to our garden. Thank you. So, and, uh, yes. Can you tell Tammy we see a little bit of her hand in the upper left-hand corner? Upper, upper, upper left-hand corner, we see a little of your hand. <laughs> there we go. All right, All right. Al, why don't you show us around your garden. Okay, yeah, we're, uh, you know, we, <clears throat> we're just uh, excited that you're here. And uh, Moraga is just over the hill to the east of Oakland. And uh, it's, uh, this garden started in 1972, so it's actually 48 years old, but still not quite half a century. But uh, anyway, we, uh, you know, let me show you this picture. I don't know if it's the same picture you saw, but uh, it is a picture of our front yard, you know, lawn and Algerian ivy. And to me, at that time, gardening was a chore. It really wasn't uh, something I enjoyed. And then one day that changed. And I went to a class on attracting birds to your garden because I've always loved nature. The class wasn't really about birds. It was about native plants that attracted birds. And all of a sudden a light went on in my head. And I said, wait a minute, you mean I can surround myself with the kind of plants I love to be around when I'm fishing along a stream, backpacking in the high country, birding along the coast? I, I, don't, I don't have to just go out into a garden. I can try to create a woodland and back and maybe something like a chaparral shrubland in front. And I've been trying to do those things ever since. So. We started with the front that you're looking at now, and it was a lawn. And as I said, we replaced the lawn. I dug out every root of that Algerian ivy and brought in some soil, landscaped, uh, planted Dr. Uh, planted uh, Howard McMinn manzanitas every five feet, 
and it looked barren. And so I brought in some poppies and penstemons. And, and so the first plant community I had in my chaparral was really a, a low flowering uh, plant community. And all, you know, this as happens after a fire, the shrubs grew through. And now I even have some sun loving pines growing through that, a couple of knob cone pines. So it's kind of similar to knob cone point on Mont Diablo. Knob cones growing through manzanitas. So let me let's show a few plants here. This and several of the other plants here are local sage, black sage, and the bees are starting to come to them, but they'll really come to them fast in about another week. Sages are great, uh, but this these are some of the original Howard McMinn manzanitas, Arctos. Staphylus densiflora, and I've always loved the fresh green foliage of this plant. And uh, I, I love the twisted, gnarled bark of the reddish bark. It just kind of speaks of age. We're going to keep moving along here. Um, more Howard McMinn. And chaparrales are often closed off areas. And I, I love to be able to create openings where you can look into them and also hike through them. Some of my favorite hikes in the Bay Area are through Manzanita Chaparral. That's just a wonderful place to be. Oh, here's a pipe vine swallowtail on the verbena. Two things I love about the verbena is the, uh, the season long bloom. And if there weren't frost, it'd be a year long bloom. And of course they're, uh, they attract butterflies as you just saw, 11 species in one year for me on the verbenas. We're gonna leave the chaparral for just a minute and start hiking up this stream bed. I love the feeling of walking up a stream. And let's go up and take a look at the ground cover a little bit on the left of the stream, the low manzanita, Arctostaphylus edmundsii. It grows on the coast, little sur manzanita. And uh, I just love that foliage mixed with moss rock. The right here, we have one of my stream side plants, vine maple. You can see it just starting to leaf out. The brush pile under it is to give birds a little extra cover because sharp shinned and Cooper's hawks hunt from overhead. Al, can you ask, go. sorry, yeah. finger was covering the screen, but now it's gone. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we're going back into the chaparral. And as I say, I love walking through a chaparral as well. This, this shrub in front of us here is, uh, a manzanita vistida, white leaf manzanita, which you know it grows native one to three thousand feet in the Sierra and has a whiter leaf up there in its natural growing state. The plant up on the corner of the house, that small evergreen tree, is a mountain mahogany, and I one of the things I like to do with that is soften the sharp corners of a roof line. Another thing I do, I use it for a screen in back to kind of partition certain areas. Uh, in this next area, we had had to take out a big plant for fire prevention. And so it gave me a chance to bring in more soil and some of the, the flowers that I have throughout the garden, the foothill penstemon, the yellow is the tidy tips. So you have a couple of colors of poppy and then uh, orange monkey flower. The, the, the tall shrub in the background is really attracting the bees at this point. It's a uh, Styrax officinalis, the snowdrop bush. Just a wonderful uh, shape to the bloom. And the, the white blooming plant beyond it to the left is a uh, Carpentaria, which we've seen in some of the other gardens. Grows locally east of Fresno. This shrub in front of me here is actually an oak. It's a shrub, scrub oak, a uh, huckleberry oak. And I've seen it most impressively thriving at 8,000 feet among granite boulders on that beautiful walk out to Glacier Point for the overlook of Yosemite. This uh, shrub over here, Mimulus punicius, I've seen growing on the, down around the Oceanside in the Chaparral, Southern California. It's, uh, it gives me a nice touch of red early in the season. The manzanita here to my left is uh, a local manzanita. This is uh, crustacea. That's kind of a nice leaf shape to it. A little different, I have a couple of those. One of the plants I recommend the most for a chaparral garden is a chaparral currant. 
Ribes malvasium. And it, uh, it's low, it, it handles clay, it handles heat, and it's very low maintenance. It, it's already bloomed this year. It blooms early with the manzanitas and together they give the early bees and hummingbirds uh, the nice nectar treat. We're gonna, oh, the, 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 the blue flower here is woolly blue curls. I, I really love that shrub. I've always had one in my yard somewhere. The, uh, the low plant here is a Lewisii, and it's, uh, I think it was sold as a plum. I'm not sure it is, but it's, it's been blooming for three months, and I just, uh, I, I'm impressed with the length of the bloom. The white flower is uh, Mimulus bifidus, and it gives me nice splashes of white early in the year. So we're going to move along here, and this low yellow plant in amongst the poppies, is what in the nurseries they call Sundancer Daisy. It's under, in my plant list, it's under Hymenoxus. And it's just a season long bloomer. So I, I love it for that reason. Just beyond the verbena, we have sulfur buckwheat, which you have seen in other gardens already. Now, as we look back, back across that chaparral from a diff different angle, you know, you can see that where we don't have shrubs filled in in certain areas. It's, it's, it's a chance to you know, build up your flowers. So the, the two uh, plant communities go together pretty well. And the one plant, the one flowering plant that you, we haven't talked about much, well, a couple of them here. One is the Clarkia consina, the, the pink ribbons coming into bloom. And Seaside Daisy, Origeron is a wonderful plant. I see that a lot, enjoy it down around Point Lobo. Across the driveway here, we have uh, continued chaparral, but here I've used it as a screen. I've let the Howard McMinn grow tall and some of them are already 10 feet tall. I didn't know they got that big. And they kind of form a canopied area that my grandkids call the jungle in there. And I've pruned the uh, manzanita so they can hike 15 or 20 steps through the manzanitas without touching the ground. They kind of love it in there. We're going past the Three Dr. Hurd Manzanitas, we'll stop at the third one. And this one uh, I love because it just, it, I just love the feeling of that bark. It's just a, just a wonderful plant. It would be great to be able to have kind of a manzanita forest of Dr. Hurd's. We're heading for the backyard now. And uh, I, I'm reminded that a native plant garden is, an, is a dynamic garden because I've always have new planting areas and this is all these are all new plants. Once again I put I love the orange monkey flower. This is a yellow bush lupin which grows locally on the coast and one of my favorite orange flowers from Mount Diablo is a wind poppy and baby blue eyes. The orange and the blue complementary colors go so well together. Let's kind of move along. We're not 100% native. We got my wife has some attractive roses in various colors, and she's got a rose arbor. Some of the a lot of people that come through love to spend a little time admiring her roses. We've come now to uh, what I call an open woodland. What do I mean by an open woodland? Well, a woodland I can see into and see through. It, it's it's uh, I can see over the low plants in the foreground. I can see between the small trees and shrubs in the middle ground all the way to the back, the taller plants in back. And it's an ideal birding habitat for me because I love being able to see into an area. And here, the birds they have a good variety of birds because they've got everything from tall treetops to the ground and all kinds of levels in between. There's you know, all kinds of plants for them to choose from. So it's kind of it's an area I like to bird the most. Let me show you what this area looked like early on. When I first started, it was lawn trimmed by a juniper hedge. I was really glad to get rid of that. And then of course we planted, mounded, and still it looks kind of barren, just like the chaparral did. And then here, the very next year, you can see how much growth has taken place. And you just kind of have to be patient for maybe one year and then, of course, eventually you can get nice woodland feel to it. 
All right, that's uh, in the low area, it's kind of a gravel bar along a dry stream bed. Kind of my trails kind of double the stream beds, I guess. And the middle ground, is, uh, on the foreground, I love to bring a lot of color. Anywhere it's low, I, I bring in color. Not only because we enjoy it, but my main public, I think, is the person that's that really is thinking about going into native plants, but hasn't quite pushed themselves that far. They, 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 they understand the, some of the values, but they don't want to give up the beauty and color, mostly color of their gardens. So I try to show them the native plant garden can be beautiful as well as colorful. And uh, the middle ground kind of brings everything together. It's, it's hard to tell now, but they're a series of mounds with rock outcroppings and some of the same plants to give, give it kind of an internal consistency. And then of course the plants in the background are redwoods and there's an elderberry up there. I gotta say something about the elderberry because it's a great plant. Brings in birds, particularly a band-tailed pigeon, which I probably wouldn't see otherwise. And uh, it, uh, redwoods, yeah. And um, so that, that isn't even part of our yard. It, it, the land wasn't being used and I put, I put those plants in. And actually I'm using the Japanese concept of borrowing because it's, it's my neighbor's property and yet I'm building my woodland down from it which is, as I say, the concept of borrowing. I see the pipe vine swallowtails are, are still all over the place. It's great. We're gonna move along. This, uh, this mound, I'm doing an experiment. People ask, well, if, if you want me to take out the lawn, what do I put in its place? And I said, well, you know, I kind of like low, low ground cover manzanitas, but sometimes they're slow growing. And I thought the hooker manzanita grows pretty quickly and the lowest form, the Monterey carpet, might be good to experiment with. Now these I just put in this winter, so they're still as they were when I bought them, six or eight inches across. These I put in late last summer, and they're already almost three feet across. So this this will all be filled in next year. So it, it is pretty quick growing. You can always top prune it to keep it as low as you want. This bush is Western service berry, and it's a, it's a wonderful plant. The berries are really tasty. And up in northern Northwest Canada, they call it Saskatoon berry and put it in their pies. So I, I, if I can beat the birds to the berry, I really enjoy it. The pink flower, low ground cover, is uh, checker bloom. Another week, and it'll be pretty much solid pink. And this plant is um, meadow onion, Allium unifolium. And I just found out last week the word I'm supposed to use when it spreads as it does. And it's aggressive <laughs> and where it cut where it goes where I don't want it. I have a choice. I can either transplant it or I can take the onions and eat them. That's kind of a nice zesty taste to them. We're going to move the next mound has some shore pines on it. My backyard pine is Pinus contorta and the ground cover is kind of a yerba buena, the, the low, very low plant. I've got fish and turtles. Uh, they, the turtles haven't quite come out yet today, but They'll be out soon, I guess. And you have a stream coming down. It's about 25 foot stream. It's, it starts, uh, this starts my riparian area, which goes down along the side of the house and has a lot of iris down there. I have some uh, mountain ash and mountain alder, and some other stream side plants, but we're gonna go this way. These taller shrubs up here, 20 feet tall, they're toyons and there's some, uh, Ray Hartman Cianothus, which I use a lot. And together they form a nice high plant base that is in, forms a smooth transition between the smaller plants in the yard and the taller conifers beyond. And uh, so I really enjoy that. I have another plant that I really enjoy that's coming into bloom just now. And this is my, one of my favorite Cianothus. It's a mountain Cianothus. And this is a Cianothus integerimus, deer brush. I like the feathery soft look to the bloom. Now over here, the, the Pinus contorta, this one I've contorted by pruning to get the artistic effect that I want. And I kind of, I really love uh, the stream. I love, I, I built two streams in one as a long time fly fisherman. I wanted the upper part where there's more elevation change to resemble a mountain stream with plunge pools and offsets and offset falls. And the lower part where there's less elevation change, more like a foothill stream, a series of side cuts rather than down cuts. And so that's given me a lot of pleasure. 
and there's just a peaceful sound to it. This plant here, I have a lot of fun with asking people what it smells like. It's a spice bush, nice red bloom. And I get all kinds of answers to that question. The most common one is old wine barrels, which is kind of what I smell, I guess. Now these tall transitional plants um, also uh, give protection to shade, plants that need a little more shade in their first years. The, the plant with the big leaf back in there is a, is a madrone and it's doing very well. It's almost getting to a point where it's, the upper part of it is starting to come toward the sun. Maybe it wants a little more sun. May have to do a little pruning there to give it to it. And back over there, you have, uh, there's a wood fern back there and there, you know, I've made a, created kind of a V-shaped gorge coming down. I love, love to play with rock. One of my two favorite oak trees here is a blue oak. And I just love the, that particular plant. It wants more sun than I can give it. It's just really leaning hard toward the afternoon sun. Now we're gonna go look at a rock garden. Now, rock gardens are kind of interesting because I think for a gardener, they're kind of counterintuitive. We're taught to have use soil and water. And here, the first thing you can do with these plants, the Loisii mostly, is knock away the soil and just plant them as much as possible in crushed rock. You, know, you give them water, but a lot less water than you think you should. I do have to protect them, however, from the late afternoon sun and keep them in the reverse slope here. It was, a, I think this is the plum shade of Loisii. And I think this is also a plum, but this guess this is a peach and there's white in there and I'm trying to build in more variety. These tall shrubs over here are island bush poppy. And I think like the verbena, they, uh, they, they would bloom all year if there wasn't frost. This low covered plant that's really taking over is Dutchman's pipe. Like many gardeners, I put it in to, to, uh, in, you know, to attract the pipe vine swallowtails. And they've done a great job. They, the first few years, they don't come. It has to, I think it has to spread a certain amount uh, to be more attractive to those butterflies. And so now I've got you know, four or five of them in, in the yard at, a, at the moment, just flying around. It's wonderful. And I've had them for the last couple of months. It's just delightful. Of course, those toy hunts bring in the robins. And I just sit in the December and robins go on a feeding frenzy. And, you know, there's, I got kind of 30, about 30 robins in my yard at one time, just flying frantically from one toy on to the next. One year there was snow on the ground when that was going on. It was, it was you know, red and green on the plant and white on the ground. It was just breathtaking. This is my other favorite oak. This is a black oak. And I always have to have one of those in the yard. Oh, here's a, here's a pipe vine swallowtail caterpillar here. It's getting pretty mature. They, uh, pretty soon he, he'll wander away from the plant and I, I never can keep track of where they go because I've never seen one, you know, Hormus chrysalis. You know, more sages here. We're gonna go buy this island bush poppy here. And Go past the uh, low epilobium on the right here, which will give me a nice red bloom a little later. From this angle, you get a nice look at the island bush poppy and then a nice look at the madrone beyond. A lot of the same flowering plants that we've talked about that are low plants. And I think we're gonna finish up over here. Oh, this incidentally is a, Desert willow. I love the look of it. It's not actually willow, but I love it along stream sides. And uh, Facelia visita, one of my favorite bee, bee plants, it attracts osmia bees and some others. Anyway, I, my perspectives have changed over the years on a number of issues. Uh, you keep growing, changing. Everybody's got their own perspective. But two things that haven't changed for me is the quest for naturalness and the quest for beauty. And where I've been able to bring those together, I think that area is a success. Where I'm not satisfied with that yet, it's still a work in progress, kind of, kind of a journey like life itself, I guess. But what, quite, what, what, would it be, what, what could I say to the beginner, uh, the person new to native plant gardening? Well, we're shelter in place and maybe you don't even feel like going out and getting plants yet. If that's so, 
it's a great time to plan before you plant. And there's several questions you have. You know, how do you get rid of the plants that you have? Well, the garden guide that Kathy puts out is a great resource. And she has workshops on things like sheet mulching, which of course, you know, give you good practical information on how to get rid of a lawn. And she can put you in contact with designers and other people who can really help you get rid of larger plants, how you go about that. The second, I think the second question has to, has to do with what do I do before I put the plant in, after the other plants are out? This step gets overlooked a lot. I think when I first put in those manzanitas in front, the best thing I did was to bring in two or three yards of soil and, and re-landscape, build up the area so that the manzanitas got put in and there was at least a couple of feet of soil, good soil before they ever hit the roots so they could be established by the time they hit the, excuse me, they hit the clay. And so that you want to just preparing the soil and thinking of drainage, that was, those are important things. But we finally get to a point, what plants would work in my garden? And I think, well, um, depends on where you live and what the habit. And this is where books come into play. And I think there's certain plant, one book I'd really recommend is this California Native Plants for the Garden by Bornstein, Frost, and O'Brien. And that's about 270 pages and at least two thirds of them are individual treatment of native plants. Probably 80% of the plants I've grown are represented in here. And so it's a great resource because there's pictures of those plants on each page and there's descriptions on how you, how you take care of it. Beautiful layout. The second plant, you know, the, another question you might have is what plants do I put with it? How do I, how do I organize plants? How do I group them? And of course in California, we have an additional California native plants, we have an additional thing. We can, we can uh, point them to plant communities. What grows well with that plant in nature? An additional design element. This book by Cater and Middlebrook, Designing California Native Plant Gardens, is wonderful because it, it, uh, it's laid out in a very helpful way. It breaks down California into 12 plant communities and what plants go in it. And it's very motivating, the photos of nature. And another book uh, that I think is a good general purpose book for information for the new gardener is California Native Landscape by Rubin and Warren. And I can use it. To, it's a great cross reference to some of these other books. I, I think there's a lot to be gained by cross referencing in your reading. And uh, another one that I, I also use to cross reference has more of a more of a focus on the wildlife in the native plant garden, Nancy Bauer. And good tips on design in relation to animals. And the final book I'll recommend is A Train Native Pollinators. And whether or not you're a native plant gardener, this is an important perspective. Because this is this really uh, shows you know, the native bees and the honeybees and how much danger they're in and what we can do about it. And, it, and it, it's just really laid out in a beautiful way, uh, a perspective that gets overlooked and is extremely important. It, it really gives us a sense that we've been getting on this tour, a sense of your responsibility to take care of the land that you have in relation to what the big issues are. So these are kind of my initial points that I would have for you. And I think I probably run, just about run out of time. So I'd like to, first of all, thank my daughter, Tammy Pearson, for you know, having the video and make it possible for me to even be here today. And Otherwise, I'd like to thank you for looking in on us and for staying with us. And I'd like to have the opportunity maybe this summer to take a number of you around this garden personally, because there's a lot of plants we did not discuss and there's areas we did not see. And I'd love to you know, spend more time with you. Anyway, uh, I hope you have a great day and uh, thank you for being here. Well, Al, thank you so much. Thank you for showing us around your garden. It's beautiful and it's Nice to see you in your garden again. Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> Tammy, thank you for filming also. It's a hard job being behind the camera, I know. Especially when I flit around as much. <laughs> you guys did a wonderful job. Well, Kathy, do we, have a, do we have any time for a few questions very specific came in for Al? Do we have a moment? We do not, I'm afraid. We're running behind. We need okay. to go to Kelly. But maybe we can get to them on the FAQs later.